Oh hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. Welcome to the first series on my channel covering Mason Martin Margella, one show at a time. Episodes of this series will appear periodically and peppered in between regular episodes of normal runway analysis, but we will literally be covering every runway show that Martin Margiela was involved in at Mason Martin Margiela. I have a feeling that these episodes will normally be much shorter, but this one will not be short because we are establishing a lot of groundwork that we're gonna be referencing moving forward in all the other episodes. Martin Margiela is my favorite designer of all time and I am so excited to do this series with you guys. There's been a lot of ink that's been spilled about Margiela's work, but not a lot of stuff that really seeks to bring you to a full understanding as to why his work was so significant for contemporary fashion. I can think of no better way to do that than to take a deep, dive into the runway shows that the house claimed would speak for themselves. All right, let's begin. People can think whatever they want about any kind of art because art is ultimately subjective. It's based on your opinions. The only thing about art that is not subjective is the influence that an artist's work has over other artists' work. If there's a single quality that it could be argued would make something good art, it is influence. The work that came out of Mason Martin Margiela is so important to the history of fashion that everything before it seems strangely dated and everything after it bears the mark of their work. In the 20 years that he was working, Martin Margiela moved the fashion conversation more towards the conceptual and he changed the priceless commodity of the fashion world from beauty to coolness. In October of 1988, a few hundred people received an invitation by Telegraph informing them that the first Mason Martin Margiela runway show would take place at the Café de la Guerre as part of the Paris Fashion Week spring-summer 1989 season. Most of them had no idea who that was. And furthermore, many of them probably thought it was pretty unusual that an invitation to a Paris Fashion Week runway show was telling them to go to a cafe in the seedy part of town. At the time, nearly every brand that was showing during Paris Fashion Week would do so in humongous tents that were assembled outside of the Louvre. Right now in fashion, we have this very strong mix of luxury with street. Back then, there was no such mix. Fashion was luxury. That was it. I imagine the only reason that people actually showed up to this event was because Margiela had interned for Jean-Paul Gaultier and was fairly well-connected in the Paris fashion scene at the time. The Café de la Guerre still stands today, and there's a great quote from the website of the café that demonstrates what these show attendees were stepping into. Quote, from the beginning, the theater was dedicated to mockery and farce. When the patrons arrived, they had to draw lots to determine the price of their seats. Once seated, they were entitled to a drink and a cushion, which the actors frequently threw in their face. Even the slogan of the theater was brash. It's ugly, it's dirty, it's going to happen. End quote. As the showgoers filed into the cafe, the speakers were blaring the sounds of preparation from a few microphones that were strung from the ceiling backstage. This is the first runway statement that Martin Margiela ever made. Before we see any clothes, we immediately get this sense that he wants to bring us closer to the art. He starts by giving you a little taste of the frantic chaos of the final moments before a runway show begins. Then everything gets quiet, and the jarring chords of the Velvet Underground's Guess I'm Falling in Love blare over the ears as the first model emerges out onto the runway. And what do we get? First look of the first show of a legendary house. No shirt, pants, and a pair of boots. Deceptively simple. First of all, we're showing the color white. Martin loves the color white. White shows age. Every scuff, every stain, every stretch of the fabric, a garment that's made in white can tell its own story. And that's something that we're gonna see repeated for the rest of this series. There's a lot to unpack with the color white. Next, we need to look at her hair and at her makeup. She looks the complete opposite of the models that are walking for established luxury brands across Paris. She looks just like a normal, beautiful woman. And this is another running theme for the work of Margiela normal people. In a statement that Margiela made to Depeche Mode magazine in 1992, he said, my clothes appeal to women of a certain mindset rather than of a specific age or physique. We will see lots of fascinating variations of that moving forward. Makeup that's sloppily applied around the outlines of a girl's eyes or makeup that's just smeared across their eyes altogether or even the use of a marker to cross out the eyes in a photo is something that we're gonna also continue to see throughout a lot of Margiela lookbooks and runway shows. This is one of the ways that they're expressing this theme of anonymity. 
At the time, a model's career had the possibility to make them a superstar. Even like today, the presence of a certain model for a runway show could make or break that collection. Margiela is, of course, here pushing away from that idea, and we'll see some very interesting variations on that as we continue in the show as well. Wrapped around both wrists is a 18th century men's accessory called a jabot. Typically a jabot is wrapped around the neck, but she has two and they're wrapped around each wrist and hand, kind of like boxing wraps. She is then coyly using the jabots and her arms to make a hand bra. This is yet another theme that will be continued for decades with Margiela's work, the idea of making clothing out of something that it is not typically made out of. We also see another core part of the house's DNA, which is referencing historic clothes. While it could be argued that every fashion designer is referencing historic clothes for their collections, I would say that there is a much more purposeful and consistent use of historic designs in Margiela's work. Perhaps the coolest garment in this look is one that isn't present anymore. You can see the faint outline of a sunburn that reflects a v-neck t-shirt. This is another theme that is part of the core tenets of what makes Margiela Margiela, the memory of clothes the temporal nature of clothing and us wearing clothing. She's also wearing wide leg white trousers. The cameraman is a bro and a half and lets us know that at the bottom of the pants there is a raw hem. This may appear to be a pair of pants that already existed that they snipped the bottoms off of and just left it like that, but what I think it's actually doing is it's showing a pair of trousers that are in the process of being made. One of the few technical details that we know about this collection was that Margiela modified the sewing machine so that the overlock was left dangling from the garments for some of them. The pants are just not finished. Yet another long-standing Margiela theme, clothing that outwardly expresses process. Clothing that says to you, this is how I was made. You still with me? We're still in look one. This ain't no top 10 list. We're ripping the mystery wide open. Finally, we come to the most distinctive part of Margiela's work as a whole, the tabby boot. We will have plenty of time to talk about these hoofing, thick-heeled conversation starters throughout this series, but for now, suffice it to say, Martin had been working on these for a number of years before he actually presented them in this first show. His business partner, Jenny Mirans, had actually sold a pair of the tabby boots to Ray Kawakubo a few years before this show took place. The boots were a pretty massive kick in the gut to most people who were looking at them that day because everyone in fashion was just wearing these really slinky stilettos at the time, and these had chunky heels and this weird animal foot thing. But they were a hit. A bunch of stores actually ordered them that day. Okay, so before we move on to the other looks, and we are covering all the looks, I just want to stop and re-emphasize this one very simple look holds an enormous amount of the Margiela universe in it. And I think this demonstrates that Martin did things the hard way. Concept first. The easy route in fashion is to reinvent your brand every season based on whatever comes to mind and whatever is on trend. It is much more difficult to establish a well-developed universe from the beginning and then season by season lead your audience to a corner of that universe that they haven't seen yet. From the very first look of the very first show, Martin presents something that is new, that is simple, and that is fully formed, and thus kicks off two decades of brilliant art. Okay, we gotta hurry, look two. In the Rizzoli Women's Collections book that argues that there are three sections to this show, the white section, the red section, and the black section. I kind of feel like there's a fourth section at the end, but we'll get to that when we get to it. We are now fully here in the white section. The second look continues in a similar vein as the first. The jabot is tied around her neck the way it would have been traditionally tied. And we just see a skirt with some detached sleeves and she kind of plays up the hand bra thing a little more. In the third look, we return to trousers. We also see another historic fashion detail, sleeves that can be tied onto or untied off of a bodice or a jacket. It's pretty common in 16th and 17th century fashion. For this look and others like it, Margiela modified sleeves that were cut off of men's shirting. The fourth look introduces a piece that will be repeated for a few other shows in the future, and that is the backward skirt. This seems to essentially be the same skirt from look two, except it's just been flipped around to the front. You can tell that because the slit goes up the front instead of the back. Very risque. This also introduces a theme that will be continued for the next two decades, and that is clothing that is being worn backwards. And we also see the jabot appear again, except this time being worn as a bandeau bra. Look five is kind of a variation on the same basic stuff that we've talked about so far. In look six, we get a really good look at this sunburn motif. 
We also see some ideas from this collection that are being presented in the most wearable way so far. The removable sleeves and the jabot used as a bandeau bra paired with the tight khaki skirt and a pair of tabbies. So look six seems to be the first look where we have Margiela proposing a look that could be worn by real women in the real world rather than something that's conceptual or some kind of avant-garde lingerie. In look seven, we see clothing that could be Frankenstein together or two separate pieces of clothing. We're not really sure. That cami and that crop top, is it one piece or two? Hard to say. In look eight, we have another tight-fitting skirt. We have a shirt with a massive collar that is tied with drawstrings around the front and that nips the back in a little bit. Look nine is another similar look to the ones we've seen so far. In look 10, Martin shows off a casual shirt that shows his concept for a new kind of shoulder. The shoulder is a big sticking point in fashion. Lots of designers spend their whole careers trying to perfect a certain kind of shoulder. From the perspective of designing clothes and actually drafting and cutting a pattern, the shape of a shoulder is a really difficult thing to execute. Margiela had a number of big shoulder successes throughout his career, and we'll hopefully be outlining them in great detail here. But this is the first example that we see of the shoulder that he's presenting for this season. And we'll see it a little bit more clearly when we get to the jackets, but this is the first example of that shoulder. In look 11, we have the floor length maxi dress with some leftover references to the removable sleeves. In look 12, we can see the familiar shirt with the cinching detail paired with a white skirt and some white tabbies. The camera doesn't give us a whole lot of details, but right here, it kind of looks like maybe they've added something onto the back of the shirt, but we can't really tell what it is. In look 13, we have removable sleeves tied to what seems to be a t-shirt dress, but the two are clearly mismatched. Look 14 is where we really get to see these shoulders. Most in fashion jackets at the time were kind of left over from the 70s where there were these really broad, stupid shoulders. Whereas these still had that bigness to them, but they were much more angular and seemed much more dominant. And because of the darts on the outside of the shoulder, we were still able to see the natural body's shoulder poking through as part of the structure of the garment's shoulder. Structurally, this seems to be a more played down take on the 1890s bicycle outfits. This was the first time in women's wear history where it was clearly trying to resemble men's wear, which is an interesting motif that Margiela is continuing here in this show. It's too bad he didn't take those shoulders all the way, huh? Those are some sexy, bulbous shoulders. The darting on the outside of the shoulders was also significant because most designers would have put that on the inside of the garment, whereas Margiela was putting it on the outside. This is a further continuation of that theme where clothing is demonstrating the things that make it what it is. There's a lot of little things that go into making clothing look good on a body, and Margiela made his clothes very vocal about what those little tricks were. In its own way, it's kind of a sexy power move. In looks 15, 16, and 17, we see the same shoulder technique that's applied to different kinds of coats. Here in look 18, we begin the second section of the show, which is most dominated by the color red. We start off with a simmer, which is this jersey dress with the mismatched detachable sleeves. Look 19 is a really fascinating one because the jacket seems to be referencing the way that patterns look when they're being draped onto a dress form. Another example of Margiela bringing process and final product into the same thing. Look 20 is a variant on this same look. Look 21 seems to be referencing the button loops that were a pretty common occurrence in menswear of the 14th century. There were so many of them like that so that the garment could be skin tight on the wearer. We also see some playful stuff with layers that's gonna end up being a hallmark of the house for as long as Martin is there. So the vest is over the jacket, and then there's a skirt with no top, but we can see poking out of the jacket sleeves for some reason. This is such an elegantly executed but simple idea. It's a wonder it wasn't already the hallmark of another house before Martin picked it up and made it his hallmark. Look 21 is also a look where we can see the fake nylon stockings in the model for just a brief second. When nylon was in short supply, sometimes during times of war, ladies would draw on the nylon seam under the back of their legs to make it look like they were wearing nylon leggings when they weren't actually. This plays in nicely along with the sunburn theme of the memory of clothes on our bodies. Look 22 is pretty standard stuff, except we see the Jabot bracelets in black now. And in look 23, we see one of the most distinctive signatures that will announce Margiela's triumph over fashion. Hey everybody, check it out, it's those cool masks. This is the bedrock 
for the theme of anonymity that has come to define the work of Martin Margiela. By putting a cheap red chiffon mask over the face of his model, Martin Margiela announced to the world that it was not he, not his team, not the models, but the clothes that were most important. I also love that the model's mannerisms are so cute here. Like, she doesn't realize that she's ushering in a new era of fashion. She's just kind of wishing that she hadn't agreed to do this. In Look 24, we see another stellar example of outward-facing seams. We also have another mystery about the layers. Are those all one separate sleeve? Is it the dress with a black bodysuit underneath and then removable white sleeves added on? It could be anything. Look 25 features the same cinchback shirt, and this time in red. With Look 26, it's sort of hard to tell. This looks like maybe it's the same jacket as before with the sleeves cut open. When we get a brief look at the back of the jacket, it looks like maybe the sleeves have been sewn into the body of the jacket as well. One thing that is not hard to tell is that that collar is ready to take a life. Look 27 just features a lightweight black dress. I'm not really sure what they're trying to do with this one. The sleeves have some interesting details, but we honestly can't see enough to really get a good read on what's happening. In Look 28, we have the first instance of heavier knitwear with exposed seams. In Looks 29 and 30, we just have more repeated motifs, not a whole lot of new stuff here. In Look 31, we have the same cut of jacket, but it's in this kind of interesting material, which is a velvet, and it looks, to be honest, like crushed velvet. And if we skip forward to Look 33, we begin the third section of the show, the black clothing. Look 33 doesn't have a whole lot to it other than the fact that it begins the third section of looks. And at this point, the music stops and a kind of punkish funeral dirge starts up as Look 34 emerges featuring a model with black hair, black clothes, and no shoes. In Look 35, those collars are still absolutely crushing it, perfectly disheveled, and we are doing the same shirt but in a more sheer fabric that makes the seams on the inside of the shirt very visible on the outside. In Look 36, the jabots are back and styled in a fourth way, this time up on her forearms. In Look 37, the model does something really interesting. She stops and turns and stays for a moment as if to say, Look at this silhouette, people. This is bonkers. Look at this. Then she turns and maybe for a second we're tricked into thinking that she's bare-chested. But she's not. It's just more layering tricks. And also maybe a cummerbund, which is a men's tuxedo accessory. In look 38, there's not really a whole lot more to report. So it's a pretty straightforward, very wearable look. In look 39, we see that this model has the ties of her shirt undone to dangle out the back of the look, which is a very subtle styling choice. It kind of furthers this idea of showing the tricks that make the clothes do what they do. And then look 40, record scratch. Literally, there's actually a record scratch. You should go watch the original video. They actually sort of do a record scratch. The runway look that launched a thousand tumblers. The model's wearing a long sleeve t-shirt that's made of a thin nude fishnet and covered with a print of traditional Polynesian tattoos. Here we're introduced to another huge theme of Margiela's, the trompe l'oeil. I usually try to find some kind of happy balance between the French pronunciation and the English pronunciation, and it's really hard with this one. I feel like most English fashion people that don't speak French would say trompe l'oeil. I think it's trompe l'oeil. Anyway. Technically, the definition here means a visual illusion in art, especially is used to trick the eye into perceiving a painted detail as three-dimensionality. So the tattoos aren't really tricking you into thinking that there's some kind of three-dimensional object, but they do, from some angles, kind of fool you into thinking that she is topless and covered in tattoos. Look 41, there's not a whole lot to report other than the fact that this is a great looking trench coat that probably turned the heads of a lot of buyers. Look 42 is a great play on Look 40. It's the same trompe l'oeil shirt, but it's untucked so that one can clearly see that it's an illusion. In Look 44, we see the same sheer tattoo print as applied to removable sleeves. In Look 47, we have another Franken garment. In Look 48, these models are way too close together, so I can't really tell what's going on. And two looks later in look 50, it's pretty clear that something isn't right about the show. My guess is that there was some kind of issue syncing up the music. Also, look 50 begins what I would consider to be the fourth section of this runway show, which is the vintage section. It's only a handful of looks, but they're so distinctly different than the white section, the red section, or the black section that I choose to call them their own section. So we see the same shirt that we've seen most of the show, but now with this very vintage-y looking sweater vest. 
This is the type of vintage garment that just has a very Margiela look to it. It's really difficult to articulate the specifics of what kind of vintage garments seem Margiela-esque, but just once you've seen a couple thousand pictures from the house, there are just certain things that seem to fit into the canon really well. We don't get a great view of this look because there are two models that seem to be on stage early now. This poor cameraman is doing his best. Look 51 seems to be using the same shirt with two different sets of detachable sleeves and some kind of removed halter neck. In look 52, we have this skirt with a belt with a similar formula of the Frankenstein thrift store clothes. And then in look 53, we seem to close out the entire show with an all black ensemble. Then all the models pour onto stage wearing these starched white coats. In couturiers, this was the traditional uniform of the fit model. Between trying on different dresses and garments, they would just throw these white coats on. It is also, of course, an early start to one of the most consistent motifs in the brand's history. The coats in a lot of way have come to represent anonymity and to kind of specify that the garments you're seeing are the result of a group not a collection of individual people. The models are joined on stage by the design team wearing the same white lab coats and finally by Martin himself along with his co-founder and business partner Jenny Mirens. Look at them! They're so happy! But wait, if we rewind a bit we can see that the first model that comes out in the white coat turns and walks the full length of the catwalk. This is subtle, but I think that that model and the group that are coming onto stage are look 54. This is the actual final look of the collection. I think this might be a subtle way of saying that the final few seconds of this show are not so much the cast coming out to take a bow, as much as that model, dressed the same as everyone else, takes to the catwalk. Maybe Martin was saying, see all of this? This is the final look. The show began with the live audio of the hurried, nervous, last minute preparation backstage, and it ends with the thrill and jubilance of a team saying to each other, we fucking did it, we pulled it off. Thank you so much for joining me. I am so excited about this series and I cannot wait to make more. Special thanks to Lizzie Lowe and Jim's Museum who have been extremely helpful in gathering and processing information about these Margiela shows. Their help has been invaluable. You should go follow both of them. They both have insane Margiela collections and you will learn a ton literally just by like scrolling through their feeds. While you have the app open, follow me as well. I'm at Bliss Foster. You can also open the Twitter app and follow me there as well because my Twitter is incredible. Please drop me a line and say hi. I like to kind of get a little bit of conversation going with everybody who follows me and I want to do so with you as well. I love each of you individually and exclusively. Bye now.